All right. Well, um, thank you for having me. I'm Michael Hayden uh, from the University of Sydney, and I'm going to talk to you about chemical clocks with the Law Survey. And I want to highlight some collaborators. Um, this was done in collaboration with Sanjeev Sharma, Jocelyn Hawthorne, and the rest of the GLAW team. So why do we want to use chemical clocks? Uh, well, ages are kind of the holy grail for galactic archaeology, especially in the Gaia era. Gaia is giving us you know, a, a, a clean picture of that dynamics of the Milky Way, but ages are kind of still an unexplored space. And the reason is that it's really hard to get ages to most of the stars you observe. Um, in particular, you can really only measure accurate ages for main sequence turnoff for subgiant stars from isochrome matching. So I've uh, kind of demonstrated that here on the figure on the right, where you can see on the main sequence and on the giant branch, the isochrones are very close together. And so it's very hard to estimate an age from your stellar parameters alone, except for these turnoff stars, unless you have astro seismology or something, which is only available for some small subset of stars. So this is where chemical clocks or chemical tagging might come to our rescue. Stars that are born and have the same age and in the same place should have similar abundances. And so kind of the thing that's underpinning all of this is uh, our little astronomer's periodic table. Um, and the main take home is that all of the different elements have different production sites and those production sites have different time scales. So if you can measure enough elements well, uh, you should be able to use their chemistry as kind of a clock or a, a kind of tie them to where they were born. Um, so what happens when you actually try and do this? Well, this is a paper by Neeson in 2015, uh, where he took uh, yttrium, which is an S process element, uh, and magnesium, which is an alpha element, and looked at how those varied with age. And he found if he took some solar twins in the solar neighborhood, that he was able to measure just a nice linear relation between yttrium to magnesium and age. But the problem with this analysis was that it was very limited sample size. You can see it's a, you know, a dozen stars or so. When you try and generalize that to a much larger sample of turnoff stars, so this is now using HARPS data with turnoff stars and Casali 2020, uh, you can see it's a bit of a mess now. So I'll focus on the panel on the left. So this is the same plot we saw before, but now it's kind of a scatter plot. And it turns out a lot of the variation in the scatter we see is driven by different metallicities at the same age. But even at the same age, you can see there's a little bit of fairly significant scatter uh, uh, for the same colored lines here. So what's happening? Why did our, our nice linear relation on the previous slide go away uh, when we had a larger sample? Well, it turns out that the metallicity and the age kind of uniquely define the birth radius or the chemistry of a star, at least when you compare with some models. So this is a paper by Ivan Minchev showing that if you know the metallicity and the age, you have the birth radius, or, or if you have the birth radius and the age, it kind of tells you the chemistry. So what we're probably seeing in this plot here is at a given age, we have a spread in metallicity and that spread in metallicity reflects a spread in birth radius. And that means that the star formation histories for those two different metallicities are going to be different. And that means our chemical clocks are gonna be different. And so that's driving the difference in our relation. So it's not as simple as just fitting a straight line anymore. It's a very multi-dimensional problem and we need a bit more uh, in-depth analysis. But before we go any further, we need to check to see if Ivan's model here is correct. So the main assumption here is that Metallicity and age uniquely define your birth radius, your chemistry. So we need to check if that's true in the data in the Milky Way. So that's what Melissa did in 2019 using Apogee. Uh, Melissa showed that if you know the age and metallicity, you can estimate the uh, abundances for a star quite well. And uh, this is showing that the scatter that you measure and that we measure in the abundance can be explained by age and metallicity alone to the 0.02 next level. Um, but C1 since talk about how we might not be characterizing this well because of limited sample size. Now, I will say the downside of this analysis with Apogee is that Apogee really only measures your iron peak and your alphas. So this is where Galah comes in and where Galah can help us out because Galah measures a lot of elements. Um, and so that's what we started to do with Galah because we have our S process, we have our R process. And so we can explore this for different metal production sites than Lissa was able to do in 2019. And so now you can see that the, they don't even fit on a page anymore. We have so many elements with Gala. So this is what Sanjeev and I did in 2020. I'll highlight a couple here panels here. You can see this is now yttrium. This is uh, the x-axis here is age. The y-axis is your yttrium abundance. And you can see we have a nice uh, yttrium age relation for a, a range of metallicities. And similarly for barium, we have the same alpha trend that Melissa saw. And you can see an R process over here, europium. And I'll also highlight a couple that don't work. So lithium catastrophically failed. So we've had a lot of great talks on lithium so far. Uh, so it turns out lithium, probably not a great chemical clock unless you're looking at very young stars. Um, and so this is just the same, uh, same plot that Melissa made, but now for a, ton, a lot more elements. 
So with Dua, we're able to uh, find the same thing. And actually, yes, true, same thing with the S process elements and the R process, yttrium and europium. The scatter, you can predict the abundances just from your age and your metallicity alone. And so the scatter around these relations is very small. Um, one more result from this paper that's kind of nice is that uh, if you look at now on, on the x-axis, it's kind of the slope of your age abundance relation. And the y-axis here is the uh, abundance metallicity variation. And all of the elements that come from similar production sites kind of group together. So your R process and your alpha elements are all on the bottom right. And so they have some sort of positive age abundance group slope. And then all the S process elements are on the left. Uh, and so they have a negative age abundance slope and the iron peaks are up here. Uh, the other nice thing that they all group together is that it, this shows that all of the elements do have some age information. So most of the things you measure do contain age information. So you shouldn't just restrict yourself to yttrium or barium or magnesium. You should try and use as many elements as you can because they all contain some age information and they'll help you beat down individual measurement errors for individual abundances. So we can use the law as a way forward. Uh, and so we can turn this idea around. If age and metallicity kind of define the abundance plane, the abundance and metallicity should define the age plane. Um, and so if we have enough data that characterizes um, a span and, and birth radius, we should be able to get around those problems of earlier analysis if we can do something more complicated than fitting a straight line. So what we're going to do is we're going to use turnoff stars and machine learning to calibrate our chemical clocks. And so we have more than 100,000 turnoff stars in the law with good abundances, and we span this large range of guiding or birth radius. What I'm going to do is I take high signal to noise stars with good abundance flags, fractional ages better than 15%. And they're kind of in this region in the HR diagram. And I've also imposed on my training set that I've re removed these problematic young alpha rich stars that we've already heard quite a lot about. Um, so they're obviously in our data set, but I don't want the machine learning algorithm to actually learn that. I want them to say, okay, if something is alpha enhanced, magnesium enhanced, it should be old, but I don't want to confuse the machine learning algorithm. So I've removed those from our training set. So this is what our training set looks like in terms of abundance age relations. So very similar to the plots I showed earlier from Sanjeev. And so I'm just highlighting the different elements we're using. So you can see yttrium, barium. Uh, we have our alphas, silicon, uh, magnesium. And there's a couple in here that are just iron peaks of chromium. So there's not a strong age trend here, but this is kind of the hedge on our, if your initial iron estimate wasn't too accurate. This will help you beat down those uncertainties uh, and help make your clock a little bit more accurate. So how do we do and what did I use? So I used XGBoost and all those 13 abundances I just told you. Um, and so XGBoost is kind of a, a, a good way to search the space. It's the decision tree algorithm. And so basically what it does is it makes a series of decision trees to try and uh, best estimate the age. So your first tree might be, if you're alpha enhanced, you're probably old. If you're not alpha enhanced, you're not very old. And then a sub tree on that might be if you're S process enhanced or if you're not S process enhanced. And so XGBoost kind of makes these decision trees to then estimate the age of a star. And you can see here, I'm gonna focus on the panel on the right. Uh, so this is now turnoff stars that weren't included in the training, how well we recovered the age compared to the isochrone age that we estimated. And you can see that it's nearly a one-to-one -one relation with a scatter of about just a little over a gig a year. And so we basically only deviated from the one-to-one -one relation strongly here between eight to 10 gig a years, um, where our S process is very low for these stars, but we're kind of still low alpha. So we kind of lost our diagnostic um, for the age precision. But overall, two, we do a two minutes. Good. All right, great, thanks. Uh, overall, we do a pretty good job recovering the ages. And so one gig a year is about the precision we have on our isochrone ages. So the chemical clocks now have been able to learn um, that guiding radius or that birth radius relation that was goofing up uh, the analysis when you were just using straight lines. And, the, and our, our machine learning tool has been able to learn that. I'm gonna skip this in the interest of time. So this is just how the uncertainties in your ages are a function of your chemical, uh, your precision in your abundances or um, the signal to noise essentially. So what elements matter for the chemical clock? So this is what XGBoost said was the most important. And so I'm gonna focus on the left panel here. The two most important elements for your chemical clocks were magnesium and silicon, uh, which are your alpha elements. And then the next one is yttrium. We have another alpha and oxygen and another S process and barium. So the main take home is, if you wanna estimate your age accurately, you need, an, you need the overall metallicity and then you need the magnesium or an alpha, and you need an S process. If you have those three, you can get, get a pretty good estimate on the age just from those three, and the other elements on top of that are just beating down your noise. Now, this is just a sanity check. So these are the age abundance trends, because now we're expanding this not just to turn off stars, but the whole Galois data set, so dwarfs, giants, 
whole HR diagram. So there's systematics and our abundances that might impact this. And so in the ideal case, all of these should lie on top of each other because they're all coming from the same uh, training uh, model. And you can see for the most part, that's, that's true. Uh, modulo some uh, light systematics and the abundances, except for, for yttrium and barium. So you can see the giants in particular have a strong deviation from uh, the, the, the relation of the other samples. Um, so yttrium and barium might be problematic in the giants and that might impact our age. So we should check out what's going on with that. So now this is the yttrium and barium for giants. Uh, so I'm plotted here on the left panel, the alpha to iron ratio, the x-axis is iron, and I've color coded by yttrium. And so you can see now the problem here, the thick disc, the metal pore thick disc is enhancing yttrium for some of our giant measurements. Um, and it shouldn't be. These are the oldest stars in the disc. Uh, and these should be very low in yttrium because yttrium is an S process element. It takes time for production to ramp up. So it looks like the yttrium abundance is not accurate for metal pore thick disc stars. But how has that impacted our age? So now I've plotted here europium versus iron versus the giant age. And europium is an R process element and it wasn't used in the training, right? So it's an independent estimate of how well our age did. And it ha should have a very strong age trend, uh, similar to the alpha elements where the, the oldest star should be europium enhanced. And that's exactly what we see. Uh, so it turns out that the yttrium being bad doesn't impact our giant ages too much because um, where yttrium is not accurate is in the, in the high alpha thick disk. And so the alpha is dominant in the age discrimination there. And so where yttrium is reliable in the lower thin disk, that's still giving us young ages. And so the yttrium is good for most of the sample. It's just these metal poor high alpha stars where the yttrium is, is we're not estimating yttrium well for those stars, but it doesn't matter because they're high alpha and that's telling us that they're old. All right, so I'll leave you here on my summary side. So the main take home is chemical clocks work. We were able to generalize this method now to get ages for the entire Dela data set. Um, and we find that uh, abundances can be estimated directly from age and metallicity alone if you have another indicator for age to accuracy of about 0.03 dex. Um, so this is kind of a way forward. If you want to study kinematics and slice kinematics by age, um, you're able to use the entire samples of these surveys now going forward if you're able to measure uh, abundance as well for enough elements. All right. Awesome. Thank you very much. Um, any questions? It seems like one son already has his hand raised. Yeah, uh, it's really a fascinating talk, uh, Michael. Um, I'm always uh, very curious why uh, yttrium is more important than bearing because uh, well, naively I would think that, that you need two processes with the most like, like, like different uh, time scale. Yeah. And uh, bearing should be like more pure as yttrium is like a mix of two. My so, suspicion is uh, measurement precision. Okay. Um, I think that we measure yttrium a little bit better than barium, at least for the training sample. So if we look at um, if we look back at this plot from uh, from the paper of Sanjeev and I, you can see the yttrium variation is very small. So the, the scattering yttrium is mostly explained by age and metallicity, but you can see barium is a little bit less precise, right? So the scatter in barium is larger. So this is likely due to the fact that we measure yttrium just a little bit better than barium. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Great, uh, question from Ella. A bit more of a technical question. Um, decision trees tend to give a non-continuous result. Uh, is this an issue for this work? So non-continuous how, sorry. <laughs> so um, as you vary the input parameter, the output is non-continuous. Is, is non so like um, it jumps up and down sometimes. Uh, okay. So I basically what I've done is I've changed so, okay, this is the slide I skipped. I basically uh, took the uncertainties in all of our abundances uh, and did a Monte Carlo and see, saw how the age varied uh, as a function of changes in abundances. So changes in your input parameters essentially. And um, I found that the PDFs are all Gaussian and uh, they seem to be a continuous age distribution. Like you don't have discrete jumps in age. Um, but I, I don't think I'm quite getting to the the nuance of your question probably, but I think generally it seemed to do a pretty good job recovering the age. Yep, that's okay. Thank you. Yeah.